share my slides? Yeah, you should be a co-host, so you should have permissions. Um, just let me know if you have any hassles. Uh, so for folks who don't know, um, Joel Pinot is a professor at McGill uh, in, in computer science. And, and um, that's just um, that's just one of the things that she does. <laughs> she wears an awful lot of hats. Uh, but one of the things that we know is that the machine learning sort of community has been, you know, very quick to establish new results and new approaches to things. And Joel was one of the people in that community who was very early at saying, hey, look, we need to think about the way that we are going about, the way that we're going about things. And so today uh, she's going to talk about improving reproducibility in machine learning research and really, really appreciate your time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Roland, for the introduction. Um, just a small technical note, I'm, I'm logged in on different screens for the slides and for the camera. So I think if you can make the other one co-host also, that will help for the screen sharing. Apologize, uh, is, it, is it okay now? Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to assume everyone can see them. Great. Um, so thank you for joining me. Um, I, it's really a pleasure to be here and to talk about this topic. I'm, I'm really happy, as I mentioned, to see the attention that is going there to to really also get the input from different points of views, disciplines. Um, I think there's a lot in common across areas on this topic and we can really learn from each other. Um, and some of this is, is really about building up the, the tools and the framings that we need to support this work. And some of it is also much more almost like a, a commitment to research integrity that I think we need to make uh, jointly together. And so it's sort of in that in that spirit that that I'm joining you uh, today. Most of the work I describe here is actually done with collaborators at uh, McGill University, uh, though some of it is also done in collaboration with uh, researchers at Meta AI Research um, who support in particular the open science and transparency aspect of this work. The, one of the reasons I sort of fell into this line of inquiry is, is really um, by necessity more than by a strong intuition that, that this was going to be useful. It's really, I was in my own work doing a lot of work on reinforcement learning and really keen to transfer some of these methods to real world system whether in medical application, whether in robotics, and even in conversational agents. And as I was doing that, I was um, I, I, I tried to aspire for a high level of quality of the work. And whenever I did that, I often found there was some gaps in experimental methodology that made it hard for me to, to, to present results with the level of uh, confidence and robustness that I hoped for. And so it's through that process that I ended up paying a lot of attention to reproducibility really more out of necessity and a motivation to solve some real world problems um, rather than anything else. Um, but when, when the situation sort of presented itself and I started noticing more and more gaps in our community and in, in the practice of our research, um, it seemed imperative to sort of to stop and address that and to pour some, some of my time and energy into doing this. Um, and encouraging others in the community to do it. There's many terms and views on, on how, how we think about reproducibility. Let me just give you a little bit of the framing that I've adopted in my work. I'm not in any way claiming it's the only or the best framing, it's just to serve as a little bit of a framework for the for what I'm gonna present today. I, I found this, this statement, perhaps the one that most um, spoke to me so it's it's why i share it with you today though i'm completely open to other framings all as well um, and this is the idea that reproducibility really refers to this ability for a researcher to duplicate the results of previous work using similar methods and tools as previous investigators 
And most important, um, I'm interested in reproducibility because I see it as a necessary condition for a finding to be believable, to be informative. And um, really the process of scientific inquiry is one of co-construction, co-invention. And therefore we need to make sure that the findings that we share are indeed believable, informative and um, findings on which we can build and progress. Again, just a little bit of definitions in terms of how to think about this. I, I'm, I'm really um, adopting this, this representation whereby we think of reproducibility as repeating an analysis where the code, the data, all of the information um, and infrastructure going into the work is the same, is as much as possible the same. We don't always have access to the exact same computer um, or infra, but we can actually uh, make sure that it's pretty similar. Um, this is sort of one step in this whole uh, work, and, and I don't by any mean think that having high standard of reproducibility is um, the end of the road, it's a necessary step more than the end of the road. And in many cases where we're going with our results, in particular in machine learning, is more towards generalization. And so even if you change the data, you recollect different data, you do it in a slightly different way that the findings will actually hold. So in terms of the longer term journey, um, I, I definitely want to get to results that are generalizable. Um, but in the meantime, you know, reproducibility being one of the conditions to get there, I think is, is really um, one that we should foster in our field. I mentioned briefly um, some of my um, disciplinary expertise is in reinforcement learning. So some of the examples I'll pull are from that field. For those of you who are less familiar with reinforcement learning, it's actually quite intuitive. It's the idea that you can train an agent, whether a human, an animal, a machine, an algorithm, that agent is trained through interaction with the environment. So as opposed to an agent that's passive and just receiving information and expected to absorb the information, this agent is able to carry out actions that affect the environment and observe the effects of these actions in terms of what new information is afforded, what rewards are presented. And the notion of reward is quite crucial. The notion of reward is used in that the agent is designed to maximize reward over the long term. So select sequences of actions such that the reward is maximized over the long term. There's uh, both initial ideas of reinforcement learning that came to us from the psychology literature. Um, some of the, the early work in terms of behavioral psychology, Pavlovian learning and so on touched on some of these ideas. The codification of reinforcement learning from a computer science perspective came more recently, in particular a lot of the work by um, Sutton and Bartow in the late 80s gave us a mathematical articulation of these principles and a way to optimize this using really um, mathematics. And so um, doing that, we had both a mathematical framework for it, a computational framework for it that opened up the possibility of using that as a way to train agents. And it's been used in many, many different applications. Perhaps some of the most visible results have been in the use of reinforcement learning to train agents that can play games, uh, games like Go. You know, 2016, we had some really impressive results with the AlphaGo system beating some of the world champions. We had some other results more recently through the Libratus system, um, a poker player that also could defeat some of the best human players. So both of those cases, reinforcement learning was used. As you can imagine, the idea of deploying a learning agent in games like Go, poker, and others um, has, is a little bit easier to um, ensure high standards of reproducibility in that the conditions, the set of conditions for the game um, are more limited. The rules of the game can be spelled out in a very compact way. And in particular for reinforcement learning, one of the reasons this is particularly interesting is because the reward function is clear. You want to win the game, you want to avoid losing. Even in poker where, you know, there's actually amounts of money, the, the, the reward to maximize is, is very simple, clear. Everyone agrees on it. In many cases, that's one of the challenges in reinforcement learning is to have a good reward function because that is the signal that drives the behavior of the agent. Um, so great success in games, 
wonderful. Um, <laughs> for many of us who are interested in solving uh, a more uh, a wider diversity of problems, you know, it's also a fantastic uh, formalization and a framework for making optimal decisions. Um, all of the applications I'm listing here are not theoretical. These are actual applications where there has been published work showing the use of reinforcement learning to articulate the optimization of sequential decision making. The reason I bring this up is um, because I, I hope you will agree with me that in many of these cases, having high guarantees in terms of the performance of the algorithm is actually very important. If you're going to have a medical intervention system, and I'll talk about one in particular in a few minutes, that uses reinforcement learning to optimize the performance of the decision making, it's important that we know that the results we're getting in the lab are actually going to be reproducible, perhaps generalizable in other settings. If you're using such an algorithm to do your crop management, to offer tutoring to children, to even do energy trading, Again, really having a high standard in terms of the quality of performance, feeling like we can believe the results in a way that gives us high confidence in the deployment is, I think, very, very important. Um, and so it's in that spirit that I, I highlight the diversity of use cases for reinforcement learning. Um, again, reinforcing the point that my interest and commitment to reproducibility is really driven from a desire to see us as a community build systems that are actually performing up to par when we deploy AI solutions for these cases. Let's talk a little bit about medical application. Uh, I would say there's a good portion of my research that is looking at uh, deployment of machine learning, reinforcement learning, but uh, uh, as well as other machine learning techniques for healthcare. Um, and so, again, using this really as a motivation for why this work is, is important, I think. Um, let me share just briefly one project that we've done over the last decade. Um, this is a project that is designed to use reinforcement learning on a neurostimulation device. And so neurostimulation in this case is used um, to treat patients with epilepsy. Quite a prevalent neurological disease, unfortunately, about 1% of the world population uh, at some point in their life experiences and uh, seizures um, and uh, evidence of epilepsy. In this case, you know, the, the therapeutic approach that is proposed by neurostimulation is to have a device that can deliver electrical stimulation to the brain in real time in response to observation of neural activity. So there's some electrodes that sense the activity that get a sense of what's the firing rate of neurons in a particular location of the brain. And then there's another electrode that actually delivers the stimulation at various time points. So if we look at what the information coming in looks like from the reading EEG signal on the recording electrodes, this is one example of a time series. Often there's several sensors, but this is one of them. And you see in the middle of it a pretty pronounced deflection called a nictal event, um, but this is actually the incidence of a seizure that is happening. And so the reinforcement learning problem here is to decide when should we be applying stimulation to disrupt the neural system. And when we do that, the hypothesis, um, which is supported by experimental uh, results, the hypothesis is whenever you deliver neurostimulation, you essentially disturb the neural system and you disturb it in a way that you can't get an excitability that goes um, in terms of hypersynchronization. So one of the characteristics of epilepsy is all the neurons decide to fire at the same time. And so this is what we call um, hyperexcitability. When that happens, really, um, it takes a period of time for sort of all of the activity to be exhausted and then to, to for the event to terminate. And so the idea is when you put in force stimulation, whenever you force a stimulation, it forces some of the neurons nearby to fire. When those neurons fire, it means they can't be recruited to join the party that then may lead to a seizure. Um, and so we already had evidence that this was an effective way to disturb or perturb the system. What we didn't know is what was the optimal schedule for applying this neurostimulation. 
And if you look at the x axis here, um, just, you know, the, the time scale at which this is happening, this is an example where the stimulation is done in a periodic pattern. So there's no reinforcement learning, just every second, a bit like a pacemaker, tuck, 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 the system gets a stimulation. And on some systems, this periodic stimulation works reasonably well, but it doesn't take into account real time activity in the brain. And so really the, the project we set up to do with researchers at the Montreal Neurological Institute is to create a reinforcement learning system, which would use real time recording of these, um, of these electrodes, feed that into the computer agent who would then analyze the information and select an action, a stimulation action um, to try to perturb the system. And what you're seeing with the little red bars here is an example of a policy or strategy that was learned through training. This work was done on an uh, in vitro model of epilepsy. So a slice of a rat brain put in a dish with a particular solution that both induces the seizure and maintains the seizure for a period of time. We're talking about uh, three to four hours of neural activity that we can record. Um, so in terms of learning, you know, we, we often hear of AI systems that are trained with like millions of samples. This is rather limited. Um, we had on the order of a dozen slices, each recording for about three to four hours as training data for a system and similar amount in terms of validation um, for a system. The reward function here is a combination of minimizing seizures and minimizing stimulation because too much stimulation can actually cause tissue damage in the long term. So we had a reasonable reward function. We did a lot of work in terms of figuring out the state representation. I'm not going to get into detail here today, but really to give you an idea of the conditions under which we do this work. And at the end of the day, from all of our training data, we had eight slices that were um, of sufficient quality to use them for training the algorithm. We used this, um, developed our technique. It took about six months to collect that data. It took about six months to train the learning algorithm. Um, so for those of you who do machine learning and are used to you know, launching 100 jobs overnight, waking up in the morning and your results are there, um, and maybe complaining about your lack of compute to run twice as many uh, different uh, hyperparameter configurations, this is a little bit of a different setting. Um, and you'll notice that just the validation phase. So at this point, our agent is trained, the learning is done. All we are trying to do is run a test phase to validate that the policy has an effect, in particular is able to reduce seizures at a less rate of stimulation. That actually took 24 months just to run 12 slices. One of them had to be excluded uh, for specific reasons. Um, but yeah, this is 24 months of just waiting to see whether your AI algorithm was uh, effective. Fortunately for us, we did show that we had both really um, effectiveness in reducing seizures as well as using fewer stimulation than the standard baseline algorithms. Um, so the, the end of the story is a, is a happy one. Um, there have been other projects which don't have such a, such a happy story, but it gives you a bit of an idea of where I'm coming from when I care about having results that are robust when I run them in simulation, when I run them in the lab. Um, this is the type of projects and experiences that I have in mind, and this is one among several projects we've done. Um, when we set out on any one of these projects, right, and we, we have a bit of a sense of how much data we have, what are the conditions under which we're going to do that, we, we look at the problem at hand and then we look in the literature and we try to, to find the best algorithm in the literature. Most of the time we don't start from wanting to invent a new algorithm, we really start from looking at literature, seeing what's best out there, let's try this first as a baseline, and if needed we will innovate afterwards. Um, in reinforcement learning in particular, I'm showing you here the um, generous um, <laughs> contributions that have been uh, provided by, by many colleagues. I started in the field um, in the early phase of this, and you know there was a few hundred papers a year published. You could follow the literature if you project this recently, you know, upwards of 20,000 papers published out of all of this, you know, when we face a problem, we have to figure out which of this perhaps has the recipe to solve the problem that we want to solve. If we cannot trust the results in these 20,000 papers to sort through it, to guide us in choosing it, 
I can't run all of this in my system to evaluate them. So I have to be able to trust what's in the papers in terms of the reliability of the results. I need the field to provide results that have a high degree of confidence. It doesn't mean that the experiment in the paper will necessarily generalize well to the setting that I have. It's on me to evaluate the similarity between my setting and the setting in which the results were done. But my expectation of researchers is that for the setting in which they have experimented, we have high confidence in the result that they present. Unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case with reinforcement learning. Um, there's a lot of things that make this different. You know, a lot of the models in the reinforcement learning literature are trained in simulation, simulated environments. I shared with you some of the games. Beyond this, there's a lot of work on playing Atari games, for example. There's a whole suite of Atari games that's used as a common benchmark. Other results are trained on um, these really simple animated character, the Majoko simulator. Other ones are trained on mazes. You have an agent that's running through a 3D simulated maze. In all of these cases, usually the results are presented from training upwards of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of trials. If I compare this with some of our application in healthcare, we're really looking at a few hundred trials from which we must learn really efficiently. And then if you project this back to a real world system in which we would eventually like to um, test our method, in this case, you know, there's no space for error. We really need to start from a policy that is high quality to ensure that we are not doing um, any damage and that we're really helping people who really need it. And so it's really a lot of uh, projection in terms of how we do this. Let me share with you a little bit some of the analysis we did comparing some of these methods. Um, in, in one paper looking at the reproducibility of reinforcement learning algorithms, we focused on four different uh, papers from the literature. We picked those four um, for two reasons. On the one hand, um, they had, for the most part, open source codes, either by the initial authors or by other contributors. And due to this fact that they had open source code, it meant they were used quite widely by the community. Um, it wasn't just a paper. There was actually several people that were reusing this code that were building on it and also using it as benchmark whenever comparing new methods. So they were essentially reference methods that were used across the field. And so having you know, reliable performance for them seemed particularly important. We started playing with these four methods on one of the simulators to try to assess the performance. This was one of the Mojoko tasks. The idea is to take this little uh, animated character uh, it's called the half cheetah because it's sort of a simplified version of half of a cheetah, an animal. It requires a lot of imagination to see a cheetah in there, but um, <laughs> work with me here. And so this is a case where when we compare the four different algorithms, it, by the looks of it, you know, it seems like the red algorithm is doing better than, than the competition on this one. What is which algorithm doesn't really matter to the to the message and today it's really about um, the reliability of the results is, is really where I'm driving at. So in this particular case, you know, the half cheetah, the red does better. If we move to two other domains in the same simulator. So you can imagine that the underlying physics engine, the dynamics are very similar. There's a hopper version, there's a swimmer version. Um, the results look quite different. On the hopper environment, red is actually by far the worst, as well as on swimmer. On both of those, the blue algorithm does quite well, whereas it was terrible on cheetah. Um, but the amount of variation uh, changes a lot for each of these methods. So, you know, the blue, which had low variance on cheetah and hopper suddenly has huge variance on swimmer. That variance is usually explained by the percentage of times that it's able to solve the, the problem. But really it's hard to draw a conclusive picture. And yet the three domains I'm looking at here are relatively similar from a cheetah to hopper to swimmer all in the same physics simulator. Um, it, it's hard to know what to draw as a conclusion to take any of these to a setting like the epilepsy neurostimulation case I shared with you. Going even further, um, we started digging into different implementations. We thought maybe we just don't have a great implementation. We took the first one. TRPO is one for which there are lots of different implementations available online. We tried them, three different ones of them. As you see here, the results vary widely. In this case, um, over time, as a function of the number of training example, how does the performance rank? 
it's not just TRPO. You would think it might be a particularly complex algorithm to, um, <laughs> to use. Not the case. DDPG, one of the other ones widely used by hundreds of papers in the literature as a reference baseline. Same picture here. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in this. Um, these are relatively simple algorithms, well-established, open source, so transparency level is quite good, which is not the case for everything. And um, in this case, when we were doing the analysis, we had no bias about one algorithm versus the other being uh, better. We were not in a situation where we were trying to demonstrate that a new method was better than a previous one, really quite agnostic to this. Um, and yet we're seeing results of this nature. And so this really is what um, drove um, myself, some of my students into this field of reproducibility when we found such variance. Of course, you know, the, 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 the it's not completely uh, a mystery why we're seeing this. Once you start digging into the methods, there is some some reason behind this variance. It can be explained um, despite popular belief. Most AI systems are not black boxes and you can audit their performance with sufficient attention into the components. So one of the sources of variance we saw is the structure of the function. In this case, it was a neural network that was approximating the policy that we were using that caused a lot of the variance. The activation function we were using inside the neurons explained some of the variance as well. And we started experimenting with more and more of these settings, whether it's the scale of the reward, whether normalization was applied in all of these cases, we found quite a bit of an effect. One of the challenges here is that depending on how motivated someone is to fully explore the space of possibilities, you may have very different results. And depending on your budget, whether it's compute, whether it's data to fully explore this, you may be in a situation where um, your results that you present are not representative of the best performance you could have because of that lack of exploration of the setting. And in fact, I picked on a few different points, but the sources of experimental variation are really, really um, numerous in this. Some of that is coming from the fact that we're using neural networks, which have a lot of hyperparameters. Some of that is coming from the fact that we're doing reinforcement learning, which also has its uh, set of configuration. So it makes it quite uh, challenging to normalize for all of that, to report consistently and thoroughly on all of that information. And on this question of reporting, which to me, you know, transparency is, is one of the pillars of reproducibility, um, we, we did a complementary study looking in this case at 50 different reinforcement learning papers from the 2018 cohort published in top conferences and looking at what information did they provide to at least guide our understanding of the performance. And so we found, we picked uh, papers uh, that all had experiments in them. That was our inclusion criteria. Most of them use neural network as part of their experiment. And the reason that's a factor is because um, once you limit it to a class of method, at least the types of factors that affect the results are a little bit more limited, the type of hyperparameter that you consider. Out of these 90%, um, specify the hyperparameters for the new proposed algorithm. Most of these papers were trying to define a new method. Um, they were usually comparing their proposed algorithm to a baseline, and yet the level of transparency wasn't exactly the same. So they would tell you all the details about their new method, but not so much about the baseline um, that they were comparing into. Um, this was 2018, situation has kept on improving since then, but about 55% had code linked. Um, I won't get into a full discussion of whether the code, when you ran it, actually produced the same results as the pictures that were in the paper, um, but I'm sure others in this uh, workshop have discussed the similar issues. 55% code linked, 20% articulated what method or recipe they had followed for choosing hyperparameter, whether that was hand design, prior knowledge, search through the hyperparameter set. About 10% performed evaluation on a holdout test set and 5% applied significance testing to evaluate whether their results were actually significant. So 
there's a lot of work to do um, in the community in terms of really raising our standards um, to, to improve reproducibility. And this was just a small snapshot of, of how it is. There's no doubt that machine learning systems are complex. And so to the, one of the reasons we also did this study is to, to really get a sense of what it meant to, to be thorough in, in enabling reproducibility from the angle of transparency. And it's clear that it's quite challenging. I didn't talk about lots of other factors that may come into play, such as like, what's the hardware infrastructure that is used for doing the experiment? You know, who participated in developing the protocol and what may be their biases, who funded the work and what may be some of the biases that are creeping in here. So there's a lot more nuance to this picture, but it at least gives you some tangible evidence of where we're seeing uh, gaps and places to improve. Um, I'm sharing most of the work that we've done with my group, but if you're interested in a deeper dive, I also would strongly recommend this work by Edward Roth, um, which uh, did a very thorough reproducibility study of many papers in other fields, not just reinforcement learning. A lot of the work we've done is reinforcement learning, and who also picked out on several factors that affect reproducibility, things like availability of code or pseudocode, information about the hyperparameters, even uh, the readability of the work. And I think he went back to 1984. So the standards of readability of some of these earlier manuscripts may not be the same as we have today. Um, whatever the compute was needed to do the work and also what was the topic of the work itself. Um, and so a really interesting deep dive in this work if you're interested. I would really hate if you leave my my session today thinking that this is a problem only in reinforcement learning. I think there's several challenges in reinforcement learning, absolutely, but it also uh, permeates some of the challenges we see in other fields. If we look in computer vision, for example, which also trains very, very large models to analyze images, we are seeing several of these similar issues. There's a nice paper by Boutillier Laurent Vincent that discusses how much the variance in the seed is actually affecting the results. And in fact, different models are differentially susceptible to this. Um, and so it's sometimes hard to really isolate these things. Some nice results on some computer vision models here. There's also a nice analysis with respect to GANs that was done. GANs are used to generate images as well as other data. And it's another field that has seen really, I think I can safely say an exponential growth in the number of papers appearing um, at least uh, between sort of 2015, 2018, 2019. Maybe it has plateaued a little bit since then, um, but huge amount of papers in this field rapidly increasing but a really nice analysis also uh, from uh, Luce Kurach and colleagues about how the training is very sensitive to the hyperparameter space. Um, and in particular, uh, in this case, you know, we see that it's really hard to draw any conclusions from the data comparing different methods, given how really large the, the variance is. And so having thorough uh, reporting of some of these performance metric makes a lot of sense um, and is absolutely an imperative. Now, um, I, 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 I don't mind pointing out gaps in our, in our work uh, limitations in how we do it, but I hate to be the one who only bears bad news. And I, I feel there's at least a bit of a responsibility to suggest pieces of solution on which we can build. So I think that's where I'll spend some of my, uh, the remainder of my time. And we will have time for question at the end, um, but I'll, I'll share with you some of the um, things that give me hope that we're improving as a, as a community um, here. It, just like a quick dump of some of the things that I've seen change since 2018. Still relatively short, right? We're talking three, three and a half years in the machine learning community. Um, some of these have um, really given me a lot of hope that we can, we can do better. One of them is uh, almost all of our top conferences have moved. And maybe for, for some of you who are not from the community, it's, it's important to, to specify that a lot of the publication in machine learning goes through conferences rather than journal. We do have journals, but conferences is where really where the volume, the quality and the um, sort of the more timely publication happens. 
So mo most of them, conferences like NeurIPS, ICML, iClear are incorporating a code submission policy, being very clear about what they expect. None of them has gone so far as to say that code is mandatory, but there are several incentives in terms of encouraging code submission at those conferences. Um, recently, we've seen Archive, which is a major repository for almost all of our work, um, integrate a code tab. So that means when you submit your paper to Archive, you actually can submit the code. As you read papers on Archive, there's a tab there that you can uh, use to find the link to the code that takes you to the site papers with code that has not only the code, but also several benchmarks where it compares performance um, in real time on several of the most popular benchmarks. So that kind of integration from archive to papers with code, from manuscripts to um, executable code or libraries, um, is really, really promising. I feel it's really being thoughtful about the ecosystem of artifacts that we need for science. And in artifacts, I include data, code, papers, demos, um, and so on. And so really having that kind of view of providing an interoperable ecosystem of artifacts, um, I think is, is really important and exciting to see some steps in that direction. There's a lot of tooling that's available. All, not all of it is new since 2018, but I would say that there's been more uptake of these um, different tools that allow sort of encapsulation of results and uh, methods in a way that's easier to then rerun and reproduce. There's been the use of a reproducibility checklist, which I'll talk about in more detail in a minute, that is used to um, sort of give prescriptive ideas to people who may not know what they need to include to, to ensure reproducibility. There's been a reproducibility challenge that's been opened up uh, to several conferences, and there's an annual issue that we publish in the journal ReScience that um, takes the best reports from the reproducibility challenge and uh, publishes them in a full polished edited form to give examples of reproducibility study and really develop that as a legitimate contribution to science. One of the things that has helped sort of bring all of this activity together is the, the leadership of the NERFS conference, which in 2019 and 2020 invited me and uh, Kostov Sina to act as reproducibility chair for the conference to help them think through what were some of the structures that we wanted to put into the community. For those who are interested, we wrote a paper uh, available on archive and uh, published at GMLR that describes uh, all of that program and the analysis we did from that program. I'll share with you a few of the findings, but if you want to go more in depth, that's uh, one way to get information on this. Uh, one of the things that we did as part of the reproducibility program is indeed to have a code submission policy. Um, so it's been interesting to see how that evolves and how quickly that changed in the community. Going from NeurIPS in 2017, in blue to 2018, in red to 2019, in green, um, the percentage of papers that are accompanied with code is really increasing steadily. We also see that there's some flexibility about whether the code is provided at initial submission time. In this case, a bit less than half the papers do that. But then when you look at camera ready time, um, many more of the papers actually are accompanied by code, um, which is a reasonable compromise. Sometimes at submission time, you sort of rushed in getting the paper all finished. You want to you know, clean up the code, make sure that it's readable, properly documented and so on. So that takes a little bit more time and NERIPS as well as other conferences have um, really embraced this step. There's sort of two minds of how to think of code submission. Some people are um, really committed to having it early on with the submission so that it can be considered in the evaluation of the paper while we decide whether it's accepted or not. In reality, um, and we did, there's further analysis of that in, in the in the archive paper I shared, um, in which Rohan, thank you, posted the link to. Um, I think the, the 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 thinking is that most reviewers don't have the time to thoroughly investigate the code, and so to add this burden on the on the um, researchers at a time when they're doing the submission and to maybe rush some code that is not of higher quality doesn't necessarily help us in the long run. So the idea is to really 
uh, do most of the evaluation on the paper and then to make sure that for the long term um, there is code available so make that path easier i think in the optics that you know for the most part the impact of many of these papers really is revealed in the long term it's really hard to read a paper and determine with high confidence what will be the impact of this work it's through time that we assess this um, having this trade-off of allowing code submission uh, with camera ready seems to make sense um, to me um, one of the other questions we we often get asked is, oh, are we going to push away everyone from industry? No one from industry will be able to submit to these conferences, or if they do, they will be severely disadvantaged because it's harder for them to submit code. Um, I will say, as, as someone who works in, in industry, um, I, I think it's on all of us researchers to push for very high standards of openness within those industrial research labs. And, and to use the voice that we have to push for that transformation. Um, it certainly has been done in several of the labs, not everywhere, um, but I believe it's something that we should continue to push for rather than um, accommodate um, the opposite. And so indeed we found, and this is again the 2019 cohort, we found if you compare the papers that are coming from academia, um, there's a, about half and half have a link to code. Versus if you look at the papers coming from industry, there's many more that don't have a link to code uh, compared to those who do. Um, some people, we didn't have their affiliation or we were not able to tell their affiliation. So that's the third set of, of results there. Um, but still, it's not negligible that about 35% of papers from industry were accompanied with code. If you look at the acceptance rate, either by whether the first author or the last author was in industry, you don't see much of a difference whether uh, the um, whether um, the, the acceptance rate remains high um, in terms of the, the papers from industry. And so this is this particular result is combining whether they submitted code or not. It's it's across the whole cohort of papers. Um, you see about, you know, about a sort of 23 percent acceptance rate, I think, on the academic case closer to like 28 or 30 percent on the industry cases. Um, and so it doesn't seem to be a, a major factor. We certainly see a high acceptance rate from, from industry, even if in some cases are not providing the, the code. And so this, this idea that we're pushing out contributors from industry from those communities by uh, having code submission policy doesn't seem to bear out in the, in the observations we have. Um, and again, just to give you an example of, of the work that we're, we're doing, um, th there is a generous amount of libraries um, that are contributed by Meta, but as well as other companies that make this possible. Those libraries are accessible. There's several thousand forks on the best of them, and many people across the community are, are building. So I think this is really a model that is, that is possible, and it's a model that we should continue to encourage as long as a significant amount of the research is happening in industry. It's really on us researchers to influence that culture and to push for this, um, really in the name of high quality science. Let's talk a little bit about the reproducibility checklist. Um, this is something we initiated around 2019 at the invitation of um, the program committee from NeurIPS again. Um, we had a few versions of it. This is the, the more recent one, but since then there's been other versions um, at other conferences, some of the NLP conferences and so on have adopted those. The idea of the checklist was really to try to encapsulate in a prescriptive way what were some of the information that should be contained in the paper or accompanying artifacts. And a lot of this should seem very, very straightforward by intent. The idea is to be complete about what you put in there. Um, it's meant to be used as a self-reference, so for the authors themselves to fill out the information as they prepare their manuscript. They did have to fill it out as they submitted their paper and to provide a version. We didn't do a lot of work authenticating whether their um, information was correct or not. Um, we started with the, the carrot rather than the stick of sort of trying to make it easy and to really develop best practices rather than start from really constraining and punitive measure. The idea was to, to educate and to really develop that across the community. We had specific items we included if 
uh, people are sharing code. Sometimes it's not always obvious what are the different types of components to include. And in particular, we had a little bit more detail in terms of experimental results um, based on the study we had done of what papers had and didn't have, being more prescriptive in particular about some of the components that had been missing, some of the early papers. And in particular, with respect to the question of what to share when you have, uh, when you are providing code, in deciding on those five particular items, um, we actually used another source of information. For the experimental results, it was mostly our analysis, but in terms of the code components, we partnered with our friends at Papers with Code, and we looked at them and, and looked for, for each of these five possible items, and we looked at more than those, but for those five items, um, we analyzed uh, a few hundred uh, GitHub repositories that were submitted, and we looked for each of these GitHub repositories, how many stars did they have, um, and how many of these components did they have. So five ticks meant they had met like all five of the components. And what we see is that the number of GitHub star increases drastically if you have all five of these components. And it's pretty good if you have four of these components. If you don't, it's it's really quite terrible. And, and of course, there's a correlation perhaps by the, the quality of, of the code itself. Um, but, but we found it really revealing to see that. We, we also hope that it's sort of a good motivation for people to to include all of this we're not doing it just for extra work there's really an impact in terms of what will be the uptake of your code when you follow this um, and so that was an interesting um it was an interesting effort for us to really try to motivate the components of the checklist from a notion of uh, really like metrics on impact of the the results so compliance with this actually leads to um, better impact of the code. Um, it's a small study that we did, but it's sort of the spirit in which we are doing. And I think as we as we develop our, our culture for reproducibility, it's important to keep that spirit of experimentation to, to, you know, leverage the muscle that we have as researchers to ask questions about the, the methods and practices that we are in, incorporating in our communities. Um, this is a bit of a dense slide. I'm not expecting you to look through all of this. It is extracted from that paper um, that does the analysis of the 2019 reproducibility program. It just looks at, um, did the answer to any question have a direct impact on acceptance rate? And um, the, the, the take home from a lot of this is you know, there's there's not a clear impact for most of the questions on the acceptance rate in, in terms of like saying no to an answer typically didn't lead to higher acceptance rate. So there's no sort of perverse effect that we're seeing this from any of the questions that we have. In some cases saying yes to the answer is a good indicator of acceptance rate. It's not a causal indicator by any means. Um, but we do see some association between some of these questions um, and some of the acceptance rate we're seeing. There's one result that was particularly um, surprising to us, and and I'm bringing it as as a, sort of to 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 highlight some of the limitations of having a cells filled uh, form. One of the questions was whether all the figures and tables that presented empirical results, whether you included a clear definition of the measure statistics used to report results. So um, about 87% said, yes, uh, we're doing that. 11% um, said it doesn't apply. This is not too surprising given that we had about 10% of papers uh, that were theoretical papers, um, so fell into the category of theory, probably didn't have figures and tables, so NA applies. There's about 2% that said, no, like we have figures and tables, but no, we're not gonna define what statistic we use. That seems surprising. I'm gonna assume that's about the margin of error, uh, so the precision of this <laughs> particular question on that set. Um, after that, we asked them, did you include clearly defined error bars? And that's when it gets a little bit interesting. 49% said yes, 15% said no, and 36% said it wasn't applicable. So it seems surprising to me that, you know, so many of them have measures and statistics, but don't think error bars concerns them. 
Um, so I think there's still more to do in terms of education, in terms of verifying the, the answers and, and so on. We did think of asking reviewers to confirm the answers from the checklist, um, but we didn't go, you know, we did that in a, a sort of a, we tried a few cases in a pilot, but we didn't do a systematic effect of uh, what was the result from there and the discrepancy between the self-assessment and the reviewer confirmed assessment. But it gives you a little bit of a, taste of the limitations of some of these techniques and also sort of how far we still have to go in terms of, of educating people and bringing them along. As a last step, let me describe briefly what we did with the reproducibility challenge and then I'll open it up for questions. I'm happy to take a few questions at the end. Um, this reproducibility challenge essentially pairs up several conferences um, where we ask people to take a paper and out of that paper to reproduce at least some of the claims in the paper. It can be just the baseline algorithms. It can be just an ablation study. It can be replicating the whole work. They submit their reproducibility report. We review the reproducibility report and we choose a few of them um, to share on the journal Rescience. The challenge has grown over the last few years. The 2021 edition, which is open at this time, uh, incorporates several conferences, nine different conferences, 100 papers have been claimed already for 2021. Um, so in particular, you know, we we see this as a great uh, project for courses in machine learning. Um, it's been really fantastic to see participation from uh, universities around the world in doing that. And all the reports are available on open review. So if at any point you read a paper from NERVS 2019, you can actually look whether there's already been a reproducibility report or several reproducibility reports of that paper. These are available, including discussion from reviewers of the reproducibility report. So it's really just diversifying the conversations we are having about the work and um, bringing that into the public domain to help us really assess our findings together as a community. This is a list of some of the course participants that uh, joined us, uh, signed up for 2021. Thank you if some of you are on the line today and joining us here. It's been really exciting to get all of these um, different partners. And, and in many ways, this is great training for the next generation of researchers. So if any of you want to get in, I strongly encourage you to, to join us. We are running this um, year over year so there's always time to, to include that in your curriculum for next year the last thing i'll mention really briefly it, which is more of an open question some people have brought up the question of whether we should make greater use of pre-registration for reproducibility in, in ml research this is something that used quite extensively for clinical trials for example and the idea is to really separate the phase where you declare your hypothesis your experimental methods from when you do the analysis and report the results. And that first phase can be peer reviewed or not. It can only be shared. Um, and so I think that's one of the ideas that we've been discussing, uh, thinking about. We haven't introduced it, uh, as far as I know, to any extent for major conferences um, or journals. I think there's sort of pros and cons to doing that specifically for machine learning research. I think some of the pros are similar to other communities in terms of having a higher standard of, um, of uh, methodology. In terms of the cons, I think there's, there's a real question of whether that's appropriate for really exploratory understand work. And, and given the speed at which we are able to do the analysis and machine learning, it may be difficult to really ensure that the results weren't generated prior to the, to the registration. So there's some some limitations of doing that for machine learning, but I think it's an interesting idea to, to perhaps experiment with in the future. Let me close. I, I think my my message is is one of embracing this uh, effort on, on reproducibility uh, together and really go back to this notion of science as a as a collective institution and focusing on the understanding, the explaining together. Um, that's really the spirit in which we should continue to do this work and encourage others to join us. And on that note, a huge set of collaborators who have been helping me uh, lead this work over the years, um, a fantastic group of students, colleagues, um, partners, and I just want to acknowledge them um, and thank them deeply. <laughs>
and thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Really appreciate your talk. Just incredible. Uh, Michael, do you have a question? Hello. Hi. Very nice talk, uh, Joel. Uh, I just had one question. You you mentioned that there were incentives for the conferences for you know providing code, making things reproducible. Um, I just would be interested to know what those are. We the yeah, I use the word incentive. I guess the, the it's more like encouragement. And so I think the the it's it's really trying to to encourage the community to do it uh, rather than explicit incentives. You know, I know some other places have badges and have awards and these types of things. We didn't introduce that at this point um, in this community, but it's something we could think about doing. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Joel, for the great talk as usual. Um, I had a question about the ML reproducibility challenge. Um, is are the authors in communication with the people trying to reproduce? Is it completely separately? Do you have you seen that after the fact the authors may have tried to help uh, if the reproducibility was unsuccessful? How, how does that communication go? Yeah, the communication is definitely encouraged. Um, and so just in terms of like the mindset of the challenge, we encourage communication from the people doing the reproducibility. We try not to set it up as an adversarial situation. And so the, the, it, it varies widely. I think some people try to contact the authors. They don't get a response. Some of them get a really great collaboration with them and a lot of back and forth. And so it's on the participants to initiate that communication. Um, we do provide the support in that it's open, it's on open review. If the authors want to know if their work is being reproduced, it's there. Um, and if they, they want to engage after that on the discussion or respond, we've seen cases of people responding to the reproducibility report, providing further clarification. There's support for that on open review. And do you do you keep track of of that? I mean, it's an interesting statistics in a way. Like, how many authors are ready to to kind of work together with with independent investigator? I think that's a fascinating statistics that we need to publish. Yeah, I we haven't done the analysis. I would love to, and I don't know if there's there's anyone in the in the room. I I think one of the one of the things we would really benefit from is um, people who have an interest in studying sort of like the sociology of science, really, you know, the the practice, the cultural practices and and bringing their methodological know how to to give us some insight into whether we're doing is effective what to look at in terms of, of indicators and doing these kinds of analysis. Uh, I'll ask okay. Lars's question because he's on a train. Uh, Lars says, in reproducibility challenges, have you faced some backlash or reprisals from seniors towards typically more junior replicators? We, we generally didn't face anything. We had a, a case of someone who sent very strongly worded communication um, that we had to push back on. And they didn't like the reproducibility findings and we just really push back and encourage them to to engage from a productive point of view but in general this was really like a i would say a, a, a one-off event um and as organizers we had to get involved a little bit more but it's not a and we've gone through like hundreds of cases so far um and we're not aware of any others uh, do you think that the conference setup of reinforcement learning sort of affects things and is there a push towards journals in in your community or it's not happening there are journals uh gmlr being one um there's a new one that's coming up at tmlr uh that's going to be more on sort of the plus one model of verifying accuracy but not necessarily the assessing impact um, uh, jer is another one uh tpami so there's a, there are journals but the volume is really not the same. If you look at it, we're seeing about a thousand. I just did a quick uh, back of the envelope recently for, for another discussion. We had about a thousand papers submitted to JMLR, which is the flagship journal, Journal of Machine Learning Research. If you combine the submissions from NeurIPS, ICML, and iClear, which are the three flagship conferences, you're looking about 10,000 submissions. So just in terms of like where the volume is, it's much more in the conferences. The review cycle for those conferences is usually about three months. The average review time for GMLR is 200 days. So whatever that counts up to. Uh, 
upwards six months, uh, six, seven months. For first round of review, often it goes through a second round. So you're looking, is that a year? So, and the papers are different. The journal papers are much more comprehensive. You're looking at 30 to 60 pages, whereas the conference papers are more the eight to 12 page uh, format. So it's a bit of, it's different work that goes to them. And, and really right now the volume is in the conference. There's a lot of discussion of whether that's right or wrong. As the field mature, it may change, but that's where we are right now. Uh, does anyone else have any other final questions or comments? Uh, ben? I mean, given your, your somewhat special position working both in academia and industry heavily, what's your, what's your take on industry sharing code? Does it happen often? Is it something they, they welcome or they keep things secret just because that's the way they are used to do things, but with a little bit of push, they would, they would share more like what, what, how, the, how the future looks like from your perspective when it comes to industry publishing in, in scientific journals? It varies a lot. And there's the publishing and then there's the code release, which I think are for industry is really two different versions. Um, on, on the one hand, you know, the where I work with meta AI research, um, really, I would say almost everything we do is published. And most things, the code is open sourced. Um, and this is a lab with 400 researchers across, you know, 10 locations across the world, right? This is not a small group of people. This is the whole AI research lab, exploratory research lab that operates this way with light reviewing from, you know, legal and, and communication groups to make sure that the, the, the work goes out, but the, the work doesn't get censored. The work doesn't get changed. Um, and, and so it's almost all of our work that gets published in open source. The reason I bring it up is because it's doable in industry. It is possible to have a lab that operates this way. I'll be honest with you. That's the reason I'm working there and nowhere else, because it's the lab that to me has the most progressive approach to this. And, and a lot of my work in, in, in leading that lab is to sustain the commitment from leadership for that model and to push for it every chance I get. Um, other places um, will publish a lot of papers, but uh, share much, much, much less code. Um, uh, and in that case, it makes it much more difficult for people to, to reproduce the work. There, there's the whole continuum. And then there's other places that don't publish at all. Um, you know, Apple for many years didn't publish, though, you know, now they've seemed to be taking a pivot towards publishing more. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Often it's researchers inside who have to push for this cultural change. I think it's on us as research, the more senior researchers to use our voices to push for this change. And I do think it's important because so much of the research is happening in industry. We can't afford not to do it. And so it's been, <laughs> I would say my number one, my number one uh, cause, cheval de bataille. It's, it's entirely worth it um, to do it. We do have to carefully disentangle code versus data. Um, you know, there are many cases, and those of us who work with medical data are very familiar with it. There are many cases where you may release the code. You're never going to release the data, um, and that's okay. The questions of privacy trump the question of transparency, um, and so you have to navigate when some of these values are, are coming into, um, into relation with each other. It's kind of surprising that... Um we can decouple publication with the release of the code. Like if you look at most of journal policies, those two things go together, right? But very often in practice, it, it's not the case. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think for the moment there is a separation, but in theory, in paper, and hopefully in the future, there should not be a separation between a scientific publication and, and the release of the code. Yeah. The analogy I often make, it's like, let's say in mathematics and you publish a theorem without the proof. <laughs> you know, that's that, you know, it, it, it's nice, but the theorem stays a conjecture until you have the proof. And, and so, you know, at some point we, we have to get to, to that point. Thank you. Yeah, Thank certainly, you. certainly stealing that analogy. Oh, that's, that's lovely. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate your talk. Uh, I, 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 this is a joint sort of, organized event and so I had identified you as, as somebody to invite and, and then I asked my, my other co-organizers to who, who they thought we should invite and it was unanimous uh, everybody recommended you. 
<laughs> so I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. I'm really happy to see so many people interested in this topic. Thank you. Thank you.